Welcome everyone to this session. And I'm um, very happy to be here, first of all. Thank you for your patience. We were having um, some technical issues, which is very, very funny since the, the presentation today is going to be about digitalization. So first of all, let me welcome you all. It's such a pleasure to be here. It's a dream come true, to be honest, to be in this space, to share with you, to learn from you, to share best practices, specifically in this topic that is very relevant today for diaspora organizations. So my name is Larissa, and I'm the Transnational Communities and Digital Communications Officer at IOM Headquarters. And it's a real pleasure to be here with three outstanding speakers. Um, today, we have a very interesting session where we will be discussing different areas on digitalization and diaspora engagement. As you know, COVID has shown us that the digital world is key for development and to connect people. So digital innovation has, of course, reshaped also diaspora engage, the diaspora engagement landscape in terms of the format uh, and also uh, the intensity of the flows. People are more and more interconnected. But of course, we have to be mindful that there are also challenges, for instance, in terms of privacy, in terms of digital literacy. And of course, there are other very interesting um, things that are happening in terms of diaspora engagement in relation to, for instance, um, the younger generation being more engaged in social media, in um, sending messages across the globe and really having this interconnectivity. So um, we know that diasporas are key in this, in this summit and we have joined um, efforts with different partners and thank you so much, um, especially to the Networking Institute to make this possible. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to our first speaker. It's actually the host of this session. So um, very happy to, to introduce you to Dr. Ausaf Sayyid from the government of India. Dr. Sayyid is a career diplomat belonging to the Indian Foreign Service, and he has handled different areas of work in his 33 years of diplomatic service, including political, economic, consular, and cultural work. It's such a pleasure to have you here with us today. Um, and just welcome you all to, to this very exciting talk. Dr. Sayyid, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's my indeed my great pleasure to address all of you this afternoon on the uh, Global Diaspora Summit 2022 on the theme Digital Diaspora Technological Tools for Engagement. Um, as you're aware, India is, has a large diaspora of, uh, in the world with a size of 32 million, comprising of 13.45 uh, million non-resident Indians uh, who are essentially Indian passport holders and another 18.68 million persons of Indian origin. Uh, the Indian diaspora is contributing meaningfully to the sustainable development of the countries of their residents, as well as giving back to their homeland. Uh, in terms of remittances, in terms of uh, technology transfers, knowledge sharing, and skill transfer. The Indian diaspora, we regard as a living bridge for our foreign policy, and we have been constantly engaging with them, and very actively so. Uh, the diaspora, as you may be knowing, it's a fairly well spread across the world, uh, right from Caribbean islands to Southeast Asia and Africa, North America and Europe, in some places uh, such as Seychelles, they are even the first settlers in that country. There has been a dramatic transformation in the digital ecosystem in India with the number of internet users in more than 750 million last year. This number is likely to increase to 900 million in another four years time and further increase to around 1.5 billion by 2040. Thus, India is currently the second in the world in terms of active internet users. So technology, as we all know, is a great enabler in various aspects of life. And India has been a leader in the use of technology, particularly for the delivery of services to make them universally accessible and available to the doorsteps of the people. One of the best examples I can give of the digital transformation in India is the issue of 1.3 billion Aadhaar cards, which are uh, unique 12 digit unique ID numbers on the lines of the social security numbers in the USA. And they are linking with the permanent account number PN cards, uh, which are for taxation purposes and the ration card for the distribution of food grains. This is basically to ensure uh, smooth, fast and transparent delivery of government services to different sections of the people. 
Um, India is one of the leading countries which has used its technology prowess to engage with its diversified diaspora, both in the pre-migration as well as the post-migration phases. Uh, we have developed an integrated e-migrate platform to facilitate overseas job and pre-departure orientation, including grievance redressal mechanisms for all migrants. We are also in the process of integrating our e-migrate platform with similar platforms of all major manpower resource importing countries to facilitate seamless migration through the established channels across the world. On similar lines, I would also like to highlight the Passport Services Program, which is the Passport Seva Program, PSP. which is a very ambitious program that links all of India's 202 missions and posts abroad with all the passport issuing offices in India to simplify and smoothen the passport issuing process. The use of the mobile applications called mPassport is another technological tool adopted to ease the process of obtaining passports. Uh, incidentally, in India, the Passport issuing uh, uh, ministry is the Ministry of External Affairs, uh, unlike many other countries where it is the Ministry of uh, Interior. But uh, uh, India will soon be issuing the I ICAO compliant chip based e passports to its citizens. We are also working down the line uh, for cloud based e passports, thereby doing away with the passport booklets. Uh, currently, we are also thinking of indigenization of the chip, operating systems, and security for our e-passport solutions. So this is again an example of how we have used technology to upgrade services for uh, the uh, Indian diaspora abroad. On the similar lines, I can mention the uh, counselor services management system uh, called Madad in Hindi, which translates to help in English, a portal which was launched uh, in 2015 uh, for Indian citizens to log and track the grievances relating to their consular services offered by the Indian embassies and consular posts abroad. Uh, the portal is intricately linked to several uh, departments in India, government officials, uh, uh, and the whole idea is again to expedite the uh, redressal, grievance redressal mechanism. And uh, since its launch, uh, the, the portal has helped in resolving 70,000 uh, grievances of Indians uh, uh, residing abroad. Indeed, these new technologies have the innate ability to empower diaspora in different ways and can be leveraged for diaspora engagement and uh, improving the uh, platforms, uh, improving the services across various platforms, and also strengthening the connect between the diaspora and their homeland. Uh, for instance, I may make a mention of MyGov, a platform, uh, a very innovative platform, which is both web-based and app-based which was uh, launched to build a partnership between the citizens and the government with the help of technology for the growth and development of India. In this platform, anyone can log in and give their suggestions. And in some cases, these suggestions are actually directly put up to the prime minister. And, and these are actually also uh, go and these suggestions go into uh, the, uh, the policy formulation of the government. Uh, likewise, the Ministry of External Affairs has launched uh, a global migrants engagement portal uh, which is called the Global Pravasi Rishta Portal, which has been devised to maintain an updated database of the Indian diaspora and to connect them with various new and existing uh, government schemes, uh, benefiting them in various areas of interest and to provide access to information about various events organized by the Indian diplomatic missions so that we encourage greater participation uh, from the Indian diaspora abroad. Uh, on the similar lines, we also have the uh, Global Indian Students Portal uh, to help the Indian students uh, studying in, in foreign countries uh, uh, and to create a database to, and to enable them to take informed uh, decisions relating to the choice of education in those countries. Uh, besides this, uh, uh, we have various schemes which are operational, which connect the Indian diaspora to the roots and also uh, to satisfy their urge to contribute to their uh, motherland. Many, uh, many such schemes starting from simple online quiz programs such as No India Quizzes to Discover India program, uh, known as the uh, No India program, which is particularly uh, directed towards the youth, to also programs, uh, uh, so sponsored pilgrimage programs across India, uh, and also to mainly to uh, scientific engagement programs, uh, which are uh, some of which are global initiative of academic networks, which we call as GIA and GIAN, and also Vajra, which is the visiting advanced joint research program to also some other programs uh, where we uh, connect the academicians uh, among the diaspora with the uh, uh, academic institutions of higher learning in India 
uh, such as the Pravasi Bharti Academic and Scientific Sampark and Chhod Ganga. These are some of the programs where we have been uh, uh, involving the diaspora and particularly those uh, who are in the scientific and research field to engage with their homeland. Um, as many of you are aware that uh, all overseas citizens of India are eligible to obtain uh, OCI cards, uh, which gives them uh, almost the same privileges as the Indian citizens. We also celebrate the achievements of the Indian diaspora by organizing the Indian Diaspora Day or the Pravasi Bharatiya Divas every alternate year. And this flagship event is being organized continuously since the year 2003. And this provides a, a, an important platform for the overseas Indians to not only network amongst themselves, but also to engage with government for mutually beneficial activities. Um, suffice to say that the Ministry of External Affairs has been proactively using the social media platforms such as uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and uh, WhatsApp, and many other platforms to assist the migrants in distress. Uh, it has become an important voice uh, for uh, migrant workers overseas and uh, to, to bridge the gap between the government and the migrants. Uh, the social media had also been uh, very effectively used uh, uh, during the, uh, the biggest uh, evacuation exercise which India had undertaken, which was called VBM, which is the One Day Bharat Medium. And uh, uh, for uh, those of you who are not aware of it, this was the largest evacuation exercise in the human history where uh, technology was very effectively used and uh, to mobilize people, pass on the information. And uh, thus, the, uh, the, uh, our effort was to engage and use the uh, uh, emerging and newer tools of uh, technology to ease the uh, uh, the conditions of, uh, uh, of our workforce abroad and also to facilitate them in making transfer of remittances of their earnings and also for uh, uh, skilling, reskilling and upskilling up uh, of them. And uh, the fact that uh, we are using this technology, uh, various tools of technology has also been uh, uh, noticed and uh, appreciated by our diaspora. But we do also feel that there are challenges uh, uh, because uh, the same access of technology to technology is not available globally. There are countries where uh, uh, there are uh, difficulties of internet speeds, the availability of uh, other tools. But nevertheless, uh, I think uh, uh, the, the in general, the diaspora groups have benefited uh, from uh, using technology. They have formed professional groups, linguistic groups, uh, connected, uh, uh, you know, across uh, uh, geographic boundaries, and then uh, devised ways and means of uh, contributing to the sustainable development, not only of India, but their countries of uh, residence uh, in terms of uh, social and educational upliftment of communities. Many uh, diaspora groups have also adopted villages in India, uh, you know, for these purposes. So there are many, uh, uh, you know, strategies which have been, uh, uh, been adopted. Uh, we have been uh, engaging uh, the Indian diaspora uh, through, uh, through other means also, uh, like uh, stepping up our cultural diplomacy, uh, through promotion of Indian art and culture, through promotion of yoga, uh, through promotion of traditional systems of healing. Uh, overall, uh, our effort is uh, uh, to use uh, uh, you know, the soft power and to create a positive narrative for brand India. And uh, to complement uh, these efforts, uh, some of our Indian diplomatic missions have also introduced their own innovative methods in uh, digital technology by creating digital portals, uh, um, I, for, for instance, I give you an example. During the pandemic, some in diplomatic missions have started what is known as virtual appointments so that instead of coming to the embassy, uh, diaspora members sitting anywhere can ask for a virtual meeting through Zoom or other platforms and uh, take up their issues. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have, uh, as I said, uh, very enthusiastically embraced the uh, new digital uh, technologies to, to not only to engage with the diaspora, but also to see if these technologies can be uh, utilized to solve some of the problems which are there. Uh, of course, our uh, collective effort and our success using the digital technology would actually depend on how uh, seriously uh, we look at the evolving technologies and how we can further absorb these technologies uh, to engage with the diaspora. Uh, and how the diaspora itself is, uh, you know, uh, keen and willing to uh, to uh, to absorb uh, uh, the emerging uh, digital uh, uh, platforms which are there. Uh, but nevertheless, I be, feel that this particular uh, uh, session would uh, help us in uh, 
uh, further deliberating on this very very important subject and with these words i welcome all of you to this knowledge sharing session and look forward to hearing your thoughts thank you very much for your kind attention Thank you very much, Dr. Sayid, for this very impressive um, presentation and overview of what India is doing in all the spectrum of services and connection in terms of um, engaging with diasporas digitally. It is very impressive, everything that you have shared. You go from the services to information, ser um, information sharing to capacity building, and I was very interested specifically on the horizontality that you have been creating with, with the, your diaspora community. The fact that you listen directly to their asks thanks to technology is something that we have seen also in IOM that is key for the further development of, of policies and programs. Really integrating that um, feedback from diasporas and what they need. I think it was very interesting to hear from you. And um, of course, we have to also bear in mind that agency is very important. Also, diasporas are choosing how to engage, with whom to engage, and to what extent they want to engage, which tools they are using. And in all of this environment, we also have, of course, the private sector that is key. You also mentioned it in your in your intervention. Um, a very important now, very important um, enterprises like Facebook um, and services that are out there. And it's the perfect segue way to introduce to our keynote speaker today, um, who is joining us from the United States. Her name is Semhar Arai, and she comes from Meta, Facebook. So I will just introduce her very briefly. Semhar serves as the head of diaspora public policy for the Meta's Africa, Middle East, and Turkey public policy team. And she's also the founder of the Diaspora African Women's Network. So it's a real pleasure to have you here um, with us today, and I will just um, leave you the floor for your keynote. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Larissa, and uh, it's an honor to be here. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Samhar Araya, and I'm here on behalf of Meta, formerly known as Facebook. Uh, Meta is the global company that many of you are probably familiar with through the apps and products and tools you use. But before I get into some of the thoughts that we wanted to share today, I'd like to introduce um, my background a little bit for people who have um, not heard of the story of why, di why Meta is focusing on diasporas. Um, my family is from Eritrea, East Africa, and I am so pleased to be following a session that was also uh, led by my sister um, from a different mother and a different family, but my sister, my countrywoman, Sister Almaz Nagash of the African Diaspora Network. Um, but my story is similar to many of yours. Uh, my family had to leave during a period of conflict and the war for independence from Ethiopia. They came to the United States for education, as many migrants do, looking for opportunities, and they intended to return home. Um, but as the war intensified, they realized that they had to stay in the United States, um, continue their studies, but also begin their lives, resume their lives and deepen it. Um, so I was born to, in a period of um, extensive diaspora advocacy and organizing. I was uh, taken to demonstrations and meetings and whatnot, but realizing the role of diasporas in advancing peace, um, conflict resolution, and promoting economic development. So it's in that vein as a second generation Eritrean American that I have really pursued the to topic of diasporas and development um, and the protection of diasporas as well as civil society as a whole in advancing development. So over the years, as we've watched the debate and the discussion around migration, diasporas, and development, um, one of the most uh, pleasing outcomes with the Global Compact on Migration is the focus on Objective 19. The reason that we're here today is to discuss the role of migrants in advancing development. Um, and for Meta, we are, yes, a private sector uh, entity. We're a, a company, um, but we are also very global and mindful of the way that our products and our tools really bleed into the daily lives of users around the world. So I want to share with you a couple of uh, couple of thoughts, and I want you to join me in this conversation as we discuss what digital diasporas and tools for economic, for engagement, technological tools for engagement really mean. I want you to think for a minute of a time that you received a message from a relative. Maybe it was a call um, to say hello, 
or it was a message to wish you a happy birthday. Maybe it was a video call when relatives were finally together after years of being apart. Or maybe it's a group chat where a bunch of friends from your high school or uh, friends from your neighborhood all want to find a way to reunite again. These are examples of ways that we know diasporas are engaging in their family, in their community, in their personal networks. But we also know that diasporas are engaging because of causes, um, because of initiatives focused on supporting their ancestral homeland. And there's times that diasporas will want to organize and engage to pursue um, social, economic, or civic causes to support their ancestral country. These examples, they happen every day. And for many around the world, we know that they happen every day on their phone and on their computer. Those examples I just shared with you probably took you back to a conversation, to a message that made, you, um, made your day more enjoyable. But it's also a very good chance that those messages were received through social media and through our products in particular. We're very aware that Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp are critical lifelines and tools to keep diasporas connected, to help build community, to amplify voice, and to raise awareness about issues that many diasporas and communities in our ancestral homeland care about. It's also important to note, we know that our tools are used around the world for businesses and governments and other sectors and other segments of society. And so we also share our message as a consideration for the governments and the ministers and embassies that are with us today around the ways that our products and tools can continue to strengthen your own diaspora policies and initiatives. So let me walk a little bit through what we mean when we say digital diasporas. There's many reasons and ways that diasporas seek to connect, remain connected, and engage with their ancestral homelands and their local diaspora communities. Whether they're first-generation immigrants who continue to follow the news and daily events in their hometown, or they're children of immigrants like myself who are trying to learn and preserve cultural heritage that they're so proud to be a part of, or they're multi-generational diasporas who have not had the opportunity to connect to their ancestral homeland but are seeking ways to do so. We know that diasporas engage with their communities and ancestral homelands digitally and in person because it's an extension of their lives and even their livelihoods in some cases around the world. So we say we know this because that's what's convening us all here today. But for Meta, we're also looking at how this hyphenated experience plays out in the digital context. And we know that this hyphenated experience extends to entrepreneurs, to community organizers, to faith-based communities, to um, underrepresented communities, to women who have now had more, uh, more empowerment and more room to voice their own uh, ideas and lead in their own ways. Um, but we also know that this is new because of the sheer uh, volume and growth of social media over the last decade in particular. It's dovetailing quite, it's quite interesting how they are dovetailing at the same time, the advent and rise of the discourse around diasporas and development and the accessibility and utility of social media for diasporas. So when I asked you to think about those examples, uh, for me, they oftentimes, the images that come up for me are getting a WhatsApp phone call or getting a, a direct message on Facebook Messenger or reading, reading news about our home countries on our Facebook newsfeed. We know and understand that our platform and products and tools serve as critical lifelines to keep communities connected, to reconnect people to their home countries, to amplify voice, to, pervert, to preserve diverse perspectives and narratives, and also open lines of communication between people in different countries, between governments and their diasporas, and vice versa. And with over 3 million users worldwide, we're beginning to learn how our products serve as the primary means for diasporas. This lived hyphenated existence and the reliance or utility of our products is what we call the digital diasporas experience. 
we are looking at the ways that diasporas are able to drive social, economic, and civic impact digitally through our tools. We've discovered a few recurring themes with diaspora engagement that our tools have been able to further or to support or strengthen. We've also begun to identify opportunities and, and ways to strengthen and continue to protect the diaspora experience on our platform. And we've also identified a few ways that uh, non-diaspora entities can engage with diasporas on our platform. So I wanna go over a few of those things today. Now, this list is not exhaustive, but before I begin, I want to first reaffirm the definition of diasporas from a meta perspective. For meta, we uh, have more or less adopted um, the IOM's 2013 definition of diasporas prior to this massive migration growth that we've seen over the last decade. I think the focus on immigrants and their descendants who maintain material and affected ties to their countries of origin is our primary foundational approach of looking at how diaspora communities maintain or develop ties to their ancestral homeland, but through our products. And so we're thinking of the, the ways that diasporas are exploring their relationships through a digital and specifically social media lens of our products. Secondly, for diasporas, for the Africa, Middle East, and Turkey team, the team that I work on, we are examining the role of African, Arab, and Turkish diasporas outside of the region of, of the continent of Africa, the Middle East region, and the country of Turkey. This is the region that, that um, I, I technically have the mandate over. But what we're doing is really building a framework that applies to all diasporas in understanding the role that they have from outside of their country of ancestry and the role that they have in shaping outcomes, social, economic, and civic outcomes in region. We know that for governments, there is a keen desire to engage and deepen relationships with their diasporas and incentivize uh, engagement that allows for economic growth, uh, social prosperity, and continued um, uh, stability. And so we also examine it how governments uh, engage with their diasporas abroad. And this is also you know, a global point, not limited to, to the Africa, Middle East, and Turkey region. So that's how we view the diasporas. But in terms of the diaspora engagement that we have seen most notably and continue to learn from on our platform, this is really, it, it varies between Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp. But overwhelmingly, the number one uh, driving, driving reason that diasporas utilize our tools is to first and foremost, build community. The goal is to build community that represents their uh, identity, their areas of interest, their affinity. And building community extends beyond the borders or their lo locale that they reside in. And so building community as a member of the diaspora can look like many things. It can look like the national, your national origin. It can look like your a network of alumni from a particular high school. It can look like a uh, affinity group for professionals. It can look like a organization geared to protecting underrepresented groups. It can look like um, a, a social cause organization aimed at filling and closing a social gap in their ancestral homeland or in the country that they reside in. But building community remains the number one driver. Secondly, another area we see um, very high levels of diaspora engagement is around areas and opportunities for social impact. Social impact uh, is, is an overarching umbrella of various ways that diasporas seek to provide to maintain, excuse me, mm -hmm. seek to make positive social impact in their ancestral homeland. This could be through the organizations that I referred to earlier, the idea of a diaspora nonprofit organization, the idea of a diaspora network, the idea of a diaspora um, initiative uh, aimed at raising awareness around. Uh, a, a, an issue. I always go back to gender because of the of the co continued challenges of equality um, for women and also the representation of underrepresented groups. Through the use of our tools like Facebook pages, uh, Facebook Watch and Live, which allows organizations to have conversations in real time with their audience. Through Instagram's use of 
um, not just the posts that you may see if you go to an Instagram account, but also the videos, which we call Instagram Lives. Um, we see that there is um, efforts at driving social impact through a wide range of our tools. Um, secondly, uh, rather thirdly, in addition to social impact as a whole, we also see that diasporas are utilizing our tools to amplify voice and to advocate. And advocacy is, is applied by many different um, efforts, uh, most notably through rights-based organizations and, and, and initiatives that are, folk, that are focused on protecting basic human rights, um, amplifying the needs of underrepresented groups again, but also amplifying voice of different perspectives and narratives. We understand the critical role that uh, human rights actors, that uh, civil society organizations, and, and in individuals who seek to shape and influence and share their creativity have on our platform. A few other examples which we've heard from in previous sessions today include examples of diaspora philanthropy, uh, where fundraising, charitable giving, these are all activities that diasporas are using our platform for. The African Diaspora Network and India, India Spora, uh, two American US-based diaspora initiatives that serve the African diaspora and serve the Indian diaspora are aimed at mobilizing resources and the time, talent, and treasure of diasporas. Much of that work is done on platforms like ours and also extends to initiatives that serve communities locally in the United States or where the organization resides, but also the ancestral homeland. Of course, you're hearing me talk a lot about nonprofits and public interest issues, but we also recognize that diasporas exist as businesses and as entrepreneurs. So in Meta as a whole has a deep focus on amplifying the role of small businesses on our platform, but this couldn't be more true for diaspora SMBs or hyphenated SMBs. There are uh, a number of, of examples we have with small businesses, small and medium enterprises in the United States or in Europe who are diasporic, who are aimed at serving customers in the Africa, Middle East, Turkey region, or vice versa. They are diaspora organization, uh, diaspora businesses uh, sharing and selling products and services that come from the continent. So we have an example of how business is being driven through our platform. And again, Instagram may, um, remains one of the top spaces for diaspora SMBs who are seeking to share their products and services, as well as entrepreneurs who want to provide their own services and ideas through the multiple platforms. Now, the last two examples I have are the ones I'm most excited about because they, they continue to be the most impactful ways that I think diasporas help drive development overall, but also to know that our, our products and tools are a part of it is, is really inspiring. First, it's really the, the job skills and knowledge transfer, the job skills training and the knowledge transfers. We find that there are diaspora uh, businesses and organizations and entities who utilize Facebook Watch, Facebook Live, um, and who utilize our groups feature on Facebook. Again, these are all elements of our product, which we're happy to go into more. Um, but, but hopefully these are also, um, you, you also, these also ring a bell for you. But we do see how the transfer of knowledge and skills is occurring between diaspora-based entities targeting audiences in their ancestral homeland to help encourage skills building, capacity building, um, economic development, um, helping, helping small to medium enterprises reach a wider audience. Um, we know that while there's much to be said about accessibility of the internet in many countries around the world, where there is access to internet locally and where the connection and connectivity re remains strong, we have seen uh, bridges being built by diasporas on our platform. The last one that is uh, quite dear to me, near and dear to my own heart, just because of the sheer nature of, of this issue, is the role of diasporas in disaster response and the way that diasporas uh, uh, mobilize their resources through our platform. We see diasporas using our tool to respond to crises as they happen, whether it's a natural disaster or a man-made disaster. We know that diasporas are the first responders and run to our platform to organize, to raise awareness, to share information, but also to mobilize. 
And one of the tools we have, which we're working uh, very hard to continue to make accessible around the world, is the notion of charitable giving and allowing nonprofits, registered charities, to conduct fundraisers on our platform that are geared to responding to crises locally or around the world. You've probably seen an invitation to donate to a fundraiser. You might have even seen a nonprofit invite you to support their fundraiser. In this case, we are uh, we are seeing a number of diasporas fundraise if, for instance, floods were to hit Sierra Leone, or typhoon a typhoon was to hit uh, Bangladesh, or if an, an emergency train accident hit uh, victims in India. We've seen some of these storylines in the news. But what we don't see is the way that diasporas mobilize and organize. And so through tools like charitable giving, through tools like the safety check-in to let people know that you're safe, we are seeing diasporas help amplify the needs of local actors. And also conversely, diasporas communicating to their own homelands that they're okay if crisis hits. Now, the diasporas in disaster response is not limited to the activities of diaspora users. And this is where I've, I, I think there's a, a lot more work and opportunity that we have. We also know that embassies around the world utilize our platform to communicate to diasporas. And so for those, um, for the dignitaries and the delegates who are here on behalf of embassies, we invite you to consider how you're utilizing your Facebook page, if you have one, to reach diasporas during times of crisis, during times of response. Uh, wonderful examples are with the government of Haiti and over the years, how Haitian embassies around the world have reached their diasporas during the unfortunate times of predictable crises, such as hurricanes, and through disasters that are unpredictable or man-made. We know that, that embassies regularly communicate to their diaspora citizens abroad, and we want to ensure that the pages and the tools are being utilized to the best of their abilities so that messages can be reached to diasporas. So I've shared a little bit about what digital diasporas means to us and what it looks like on the platform. I want to close out with just a couple points. One, you're probably wondering, how do we do this work? What does this mean? Well, we I am a part of the Africa, Middle East, Turkey public policy team. This is um, one of many public policy teams that Meta has for our global work. Uh, there are teams dedicated to different countries around the world, practically every country. Um, and it's really an opportunity and a priority for Meta to understand what the public policy challenges and opportunities are, what the uh, environment, operating environment looks like inside a country, but also globally, understanding the trends and the uh, developments happening that relate to either technology or business or development or issues that are as fundamental as free speech and expression and human rights protections. So our public policy team engages with different governments um, and civil society actors inside the country. But what we know is also diasporas are also critical stakeholders in the civil society ecosystem. So when we say civil society, we are recognizing diasporas as a part of civil society. Even though they live in, outside of the country, they continue to shape outcomes, in many cases economic, in some cases socially, and in some cases civically. So we consider the diaspora as a stakeholder in uh, public policy uh, objectives, but we also recognize that they have a unique set of circumstances and needs. So my team uh, engages with diaspora stakeholders of African, Arab, and Turkish descent as well as because we are the lead team on diaspora issues at Meta, we work with other diaspora communities and public policy teams that have opportunities. So our Philippines office, our India office, two examples of offices that already engage with diasporas due to the sheer nature of investment on diasporas in country and in the diaspora. But our job is to listen and learn from diaspora experiences, identify challenges and opportunities, and help make the product more useful, impactful, and safer for users around the world. And so that's the, that is, when I think of what's top of mind for our team, is really around amplifying the digital diaspora experience um, and, and, and working to make sure that it's as safe and as effective as possible for users, but also for uh, other users who may be recipients of that content. So top of mind for us is the future of what this continues to look like. We know diasporas will continue to engage digitally. 
but how can we keep them safe? How can we amplify their voice? How do we ensure diasporas understand how to correctly use the platform? When it comes to the threats and risks of platforms with uh, users, as, as many users as we have, there's always daily risks of misinformation, uh, risks to per personal harm, uh, the sort of negative and, and more risky sides of human behavior can unfold on our platform. And we recognize the need to ensure that diasporas, like every other user, understands our community standards, understands the rules and the parameters of operating on our framework, understands the risks of what violating those standards looks like, and understands uh, what, the, what the goals and objectives of a platform like ours are so that it isn't misused. The other thing that's top of mind in addition to privacy and safety of our users is the future of not just the internet, but the future of social media. And as Meta, we've unveiled our vision for the future in the metaverse and the idea of the world being digitally, virtually connected and thinking deeply about two things, the digital divide that is at risk for users around the world who don't have internet access but also the critical role of diasporas in building that bridge for the future with the metaverse and helping continue the examples that I shared earlier of, of diasporas in disaster response, of diasporas in development, of knowledge sharing, of skills transfer, how we do that virtually in the metaverse. There was a fantastic example I saw of an Armenian American uh, young man who took our headset, which is called the Oculus, and he shared it with his I think 101 year old Armenian grandmother. And when she, when he gave her the headset, it had he had set up the visuals for a church in Armenia that she had gone to growing up. And when she put this headset on, it looked funny at first because she's she's an elderly woman with this headset. But the minute she saw the visuals of the church, it brought back not just the feeling of home, but it brought back all of her senses as if she was there inside the church. It's a reminder of how the future with the metaverse can preserve our cultural heritage, can preserve our different identities, our different um, experiences lived and shared as people of the diaspora. And so we want to make sure that diasporas can continue to help connect and build those bridges as much as we focus on how we make tools like ours accessible to local communities around the world. Um, I, I, I'm noting time and I want to end with just uh, a, a deep note of gratitude to all of you for joining us, but especially to the IOM and the Government of Ireland for inviting us and hosting this GDS. A, a deep honor to the Government of India for hosting this session. And um, also just of many years of work in this space, I want to extend deep gratitude to the Networking Institute and to Kingsley Aikens and Martin Russell for their continued partnership and support and leadership on this issue. Um, lastly, I will always note that for the women of the diaspora who are on this call, particularly the women from the Global South, your work continues to inspire and open new doors that we know are needed for our societies around the world. And for the, for the women of the African diaspora in particular, your work is phenomenal and I remain proud to be a part of the community. So thank you again, and I look forward to hearing from our next guest. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was such an inspiring talk. I'm so grateful to be in this panel and to learn from your experience, specifically from the private sector. You have touched upon so many topics. I will try to summarize them, but uh, it has been incredible to listen to your experience. I really appreciated the part on the emotional, um, you highlighted the emotional level of engagement in, in, in the digital world that sometimes is not that much unpacked. And I really like the, the, the um, responses to, to crisis that you mentioned. I absolutely concur with you. Uh, when an earthquake hit my homeland, the first thing I did was to check on Facebook how, how were they, to check to, to have that connectivity. So you're absolutely right on highlighting that emotional level, the connectivity level, and also the, the fact that diasporas are sharing their experiences through um, the digital world, but also taking into consideration their multi-layered identities. Women are choosing how to engage. Um, you mentioned the, the case of the African women, but 
from which country at the regional level, at the, the local level. So all of these layers are really interesting to unpack. And I think uh, at IOM, we are also conscious of that, of the global level that you were mentioning. We have specifically developed um, a tool, a platform that is called I, I Diaspora, and I will invite you all to, to look at it and join. Um, I also really like the, the purpose that you mentioned. Why are people engaging? What's the purpose behind? Is it to collect money? Is it to create emotional ties? Is it to, is it to reaffirm the, their identity? All of this is, is wonderful to, to really unpack it in this area of diaspora engagement. And I also enjoyed a lot the fun part of it. So younger generations are using more Instagram, Facebook leaders. Um, I think uh, it's more, um, it, it's tailored, right? So Meta has also all of this spectrum of how people decide to engage and to create their own content. I think that's very valuable overall at, the, at all the levels we have been um, discussing. And also the purpose, I also highlighted the advocacy Absolutely right. There are so many movements that are growing in the digital space and connecting people even globally. So it goes beyond borders. So thank you so much for highlighting that, that part also. Finally, the only thing that I want to, to, um, to mention is that multi-stakeholder approach that you mentioned and how you're, set, you're developing tools and addressing the user experience and putting diasporas in the center of this development. So with that, I will finally give the floor um, to our last speaker, who um, I'm also really excited to, to listen to um, from, from his experience directly um, from um, a diaspora organization. So it's a pleasure to introduce Ms. Uh, Dr. Kumar, who is the president of the Vedic Hindu Cultural Center of Ireland. So another very exciting way of engaging, which is the cultural side of diaspora. Sometimes we don't really think about it, but I think it's crucial, right? It's the fuel that keeps diaspora engaging. It's the fuel that keeps us connected and engaging in, in the different spaces. So thank you so much again, Semhari. It has been a pleasure to learn from you. Dr. Kumar, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Elisa, <coughs> for giving that introduction. Uh, after listening to a very technical person and uh, and, and to Dr. Said, it's very difficult to come into their shoes. I'll be just speaking on very general, general uh, way of uh, in involvement. So my topic would be mainly digital diaspora technological tools for engagement. So dear friends, we are delighted to know that International Organization of Migration is organizing global diaspora summit on the issues relating to diaspora migration. I feel privileged to be a part of summit. We have to understand the meaning of digital diaspora before understanding the role of technological tools influencing the digital diaspora. As Sam has already summarized, the diaspora means a group of people who spread from one original country to the other countries. And digital diaspora is defined as distinct online networks share opportunities, spread their culture, influence homeland and hostland policy, or create debate about common interest issues by means of electronic devices. All technical, technical tools like Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, TikTok came in the last two to three decades. I remember when I arrived in Ireland, I'm speaking from Dublin, there were very few immigrants when I arrived. Only foreigners seen here were either doctors or engineers. There were quite a few business community as well. It was a tough time to connect with the people and to get a feeling of diaspora at that time. We were meeting in social, cultural, religious gatherings. There were few active volunteers who were ringing everyone and trying to bring community to these functions. Then came the emails. We could connect everyone with one click. And then came, came the Facebook, now known as Meta and WhatsApp, WhatsApp, which is helping in the same way. Now, the recent advancements in communication technologies have led to the proliferation of new virtual formations and of digital diasporic networks. These digital formations have facilitated 
and transformed the possibilities of diasporic affiliations. When digital technology tools applied to migrant culture, diaspora becomes more relevant as it allows the bonding which strengthens the ethnic ties and bridges the gap in the community. With these tools, one can reach beyond the specificity of groups, ethnicities, or even nations. Diasporas have the capacity to influence policy changes easily and quickly, to show their solidarity through lobbying, and to strengthen social bonds, professional networks, and relationships. These digital tools have made this summit possible. Effects of technological digital tools on immigrants and diaspora. These digital tools have changed the ways we live our lives and has changed the thinking process of mind. Diaspora was never so connected as they are today. Digital connectivity offered mobile phones, which has effect on every aspect of migration. It provides access to formation, access to information pre-migration, during journeys, and in destination countries, facilities, remittances, and helps migrants to stay connected to the families. We should try to improve knowledge about the benefits of migration and ways to gain from migration by the use of technology. Digital India campaign by Government of India is also helping in advancements of technological tools and Dr. Said has already explained few, uh, has given a few examples of these, uh, these advancements. There is a lot of scope of expansion of digital diaspora. It needs proper policies to engage the diaspora by the government, measures aimed at engaging, maintaining, and developing a relationship with their diaspora. Policies to include the rights and protection of diaspora it will lead to strong relationship and facilitating diaspora contributions to host countries' social and economic development. There should be diaspora support programs to connect with the host country. The skills which diaspora has learned better in the migrant country should be able to transfer easily to the host country. Diasporas to be taken as new partners in the global development policy. It will be a win-win situation for all the diaspora, the host country, and the migrant country. Ireland is not behind in using technological tools. All organizations are connected digitally by making groups. Their meetings and get-togethers are organized by using different social platforms. This digital technology is a boon in, in a co in, it was a boon in COVID times, although everyone was confined to home, but digital platforms were more active and were being used as lifeline for connectivity. Every individual, personally and on the group level, is being benefited by these technological tools. On one click, information can be disseminated easily. As we all know that everything comes with a price, these technological tools collect a lot of individual data. Hackers can hack and misuse the data, which happened recently with HSE in Ireland, and before that it happened with NHS in the UK. That leaked information is still causing havoc. In some instances, profiles can be made with fake names, and can be used in few different ways. Terrorists are using these tools to spread their agenda. So international community has to come out with stringent laws against all these crimes. By far, technological tools are, more benef are very beneficial for the diaspora and for the immigrants. In a nutshell, advantages are much greater than the disadvantages. Thank you very much. Thanks.
Thank you very much, Dr. Kumar, for highlighting all the benefits of having this interconnectivity across the world and having access to these tools and what diasporas can do with all of these, um, I, I would say, very um, evolving tools also. So I would like to start the conversation. We, we have 20 minutes to do so. So to make it a little bit more interactive, I have seen a um, couple of questions and I will give the, the floor if, if you are willing to do to unmute yourselves just to make this a little bit more conversational, I think. Um, it's always more engaging that way. So um, can I just um, ask uh, Tracy O'Connor to unmute yourself if, if, if possible? Um, you were having a question on specifically the voice of diasporas. So maybe we can start the conversation from there if it's okay. Sure. Thanks, Larissa. And Thank uh, thanks, Demar. Thanks, uh, Dr. Kumar and Dr. Said for your contributions today. Um, I'm based in Dublin and um, I was a diaspora <laughs> outside Ireland for about nine years and have um, I'm home quite a long time. But I was interested to note, uh, uh, Dr. Kumar, when you mentioned about the impact that diaspora have on, on changing policy, I wonder, it, was that in relation to policies in their host land or in their homeland? And I wonder how much of a voice diaspora actually have when it comes to changing policies in their homeland, because it seems that they're kind of removed from, from that container of the land. Um, and I'm wondering if any of you have any background information on that. Thank you. Thanks very much for asking this question, Tracy. Uh, uh, I definitely feel uh, that it does and it can change the policy. The way I, I as like with the with this technologies, we can always connect the people very quickly, and uh, then we can have the meetings with with the hierarchy which was not there before. And when we connect the political people, and when the political people know that there's a big di diaspora which can affect them politically as well and they are very happy to change the situation, which we have done in Ireland in the past, that our local politicians who were, happened to be few ministers as well, and when this diaspora were, was here, they didn't know whom to reach, how to reach, where to reach. So I, I was organizing the meetings with our local politicians who were ministers as well, with the local people of the diaspora, and we were collecting about 100, 200 people in one meetings, and we had few meetings all the time. And then people were directly talking to with the ministers and their secretaries in those, in those meetings, and about 80, 90% problems were solved. So this was the way we were affecting the people, and people were very happy as well. And the government was happy as well, that government could reach to the people, and people were happy that they were there reaching, they are getting their problems solved. In the same way, to the host in, in the host uh, in the country from where they came, I mean, they can make these type of forums, as already explained by uh, Samer, that uh, in, in the time of, I mean, in the normal times, they can uh, affect, like I mean, that uh, they can adopt the villages by coming together and change the environment and change change the situation. They can send remittances, which can be very helpful to the uh, to their to their homeland country. So these type of things one can see and then uh, they can be in touch with their own embassies and then through the embassies to the, with the government that whatever our needs are. So some of the needs I have already explained that we need, it should be seen as a global developmental policy and it should be given more legal status so that we can be more involved to help uh, ourselves in our homeland country as well. Mm, thank Tracy, you very much. If I could also just add to Dr. Kumar's points, I think diasporas are shaping policy outcomes in, in a range of ways. It So much of this depends on, there's two things. There's whether the government has created policies to incentivize that engagement or whether there's outside pressure from diasporas to consider a policy issue. So a lot of times you'll see diasporas um, shaping outcomes around health disparities or opportunities for economic investment. Um, creating jobs. Um, it really depends on the environment of the uh, ancestral homeland. 
um, the willingness of the government to to open its doors. And many governments are willing because they don't want their migrants to be disconnected. And it's just about identifying where that alignment exists and where there is not alignment, where there may not be a policy prioritization by the government. There are a number of examples of diasporas uh, pursuing it through advocacy um, on, on, a, on an issue. So I think policy is a tough word because it means so many things, right? So um, within social policy, there's, there's all types of issues with housing and jobs and education and um, health. And then economic, it's everything from job creation to remittances to investment. And, you know, it, so unpacking the policy opportunities is quite, quite intense. Um, but governments such as India and uh, many other governments who I think are here on the call have begun to develop policies specifically targeting diaspora's engagements to, to change and, and improve and strengthen policies. I think the challenge will always be that diasporas, because they don't live at home. Uh, in your case, you're a returnee. So congratulations. And, and what a wonderful experience to come back home. But because most diasporas are not able to return in the way that they imagined, there's also a little bit of um, realization of policy advancement versus sort of this ideal thing should be versus what is actually feasible right now. So yeah, over the years with the different governments and countries I've worked on and with and the diaspora communities, that has that's kind of been the breakdown. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we have quite um, a number of questions in the chat. I will give the floor very briefly to Dr. Um, Russell, Martin Russell, um, to, to do his question. I think it's it's much more engaging this way. Samar, how are you, my friend? Time for a cheeky question. <laughs> you know, look, I, th I think what's interesting to me, I, I think it's actually quite a transformative moment for diaspora engagement when, when a global technology, technology player like yourself has stepped into the place in the sense of diaspora engagement. So I'm wondering, you know, over the last 10 years, we've been kind of saying private sector, private sector, private sector need to get a little bit more active. So do you see other global technology companies missing anything in the sense of the opportunities around diaspora engagement? Or is it actually on us to think about, you know, how do we actually articulate and communicate the, the opportunity to these players? Because we're beginning to see more conversations through such companies, but I think it's critically important as you showcased because of the different tools that you have to, to get those companies involved. Yeah, uh, great to see you, Martin. And I'm very, very happy to hear your question. A couple of things. I think the reason Meta uh, focused on diasporas in this way, in the way that we've committed ourselves to, is because we understand our user uh, behaviors and realities, especially from the African, um, Middle East, and Turkish world. Um, I think it's the same for APAC. I think there's a number of Asian countries with diasporas abroad, and those countries and governments probably exist, coexist in a very fluid way. I know that um, parts of Meta already do diaspora work. It just isn't built and packaged in that way. So first and foremost, it's really how we view our users and how we understand our users existing in such a global reality. Um, and I think technology is probably one of the first. You, you'll love this, Martin. There's, I, I had I had a, a epiphany a, a while back when I started at Meta because for many of you, I spent most of my career in public sector and making the move to private sector was just unheard of. But but I think there are certain industries that are so relevant to the diaspora experience and to and to the homelands that we come from. And there's these moments where industries get the light bulb. And, and for me, those industries were telecom. When you think of how quickly the telecom industries understood the way we make long distance calls, when you think of... Um, uh, what's the word? What's the word I want? Mm -hmm. Airport, airplanes, travel. The travel industry understood how we are. We go home two to three times a year. That is a massive consumer base. And the other one was remittance sending. You know, the fintech space understands diasporas. Um, and even before it was fintech, just Western Union MoneyGram. And I think tech is the next is the sort of 21st century industry. I don't know where my colleagues and other uh, companies are on this. But given the sheer size of our product and reach, it's imperative that we apply that because as an African, I, I'm, I'm technically American. I am American, but I identify as Eritrean, right? But I don't live in Eritrea and I don't have um, the lived experience of someone inside Eritrea. So, so in many ways, I am behaving and operating as a Western diaspora American, 
but I have an African invest focus. I mean, it's, it's again, the, the, the complications of being in the diaspora and those complications define our user behavior. And what, what one company may think a Western user may want may actually be true for um, someone in another country that is not in Europe or the U S. So uh, that's why we focus on members of the diaspora, particularly from the global South who live in the West, because the sensibilities and, and utility of this function goes far beyond what an average user may use, which is building community, promoting business, amplifying voice. But for diasporas, it's life-saving and it's critical. Um, so I appreciate your question, Martin, but I think we view, and we don't view our users as consumers or customers, right? We understand this is a user experience for their lives, for their just relationships. So that's what we want to uh, deepen and help protect. Thank you so much, uh, Semhar, for that um, response. We also have another question. I think it's also addressed to you from Sandra Bulos. So if you want to unmute yourself, please. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm Sandra. I'm from the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. And uh, yeah, thanks for these great presentations. And I would have a question, yes, to Ms. Simhar. Um, it was very interesting to see the different uh, opportunities that the diaspora, um, or the different reasons that I, a diaspora is used to, to use the platforms of Meta. And also that, that you, you showcased also the risks around using these platforms. And obviously that's a huge challenge. Um, and in, in that way, I was wondering, like, how, how do you, how do you support the users or specifically also diaspora to mitigate these risks that are, um, uh, linked to also the digital platforms? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that, Sandra. It's a huge question. It's a huge issue for us. So generally speaking, misinformation or harm on our platform is priority, num reducing and mitigating harm is priority number one, regardless of the user. But for diasporas, I think it's also in particularly important because the impact of diasporas content is, is not only for their local and personal networks, but it's quite global, just naturally. So um, in terms of mitigating risks around harm and misinfo, we do a few things. One, we have multiple teams focused on uh, fighting misinfo, on our content policies, on ensuring that um, our policies actually make sense or can be uh, pr protecting user experiences. And so public policy and other teams, we, we all work jointly to, to assess sort of where the company stands on these issues or what is the challenge and the, and the risk. and then. You know, secondly, we engage with users to help them understand um, what they can do to fight misinfo and what they can do to ensure that they're not promoting misinfo. I'm sure there's times where you've seen um, something on your Facebook newsfeed that says this is um, a, a, a pop up may show up or it may say to learn more about, for instance, COVID-19, please click here. Those are some of the sort of automated examples. But we spend quite a lot of time working with users and diaspora stakeholders in particular to explain to them what the community standards are. Community standards is basically the company's policies and uh, parameters for uh, acceptable behavior on our platform and what is deemed a violation. And those community standards really cover the wide range of violations, everything. Be because what is, what is never easy to say is just, that human behavior can also be quite harmful. And you see very, very difficult things on our platform that we want to uh, mm -hmm. keep away or keep off or prevent people from being able to do. Um, so for diasporas, these community standards are critical for two reasons. One, it's informing them that these, that these are the rules and policies, and this is why your page may be taken down or may be um, penalized. This is why your, your, your ability to post may be reduced. Uh, there is usually uh, a, a way for diasporas to understand community standards in advance. Now, granted, I'll say two things. It's quite dense because it's, an, it's a wide range of issues. So this is a 72-page report of community standards policies, which goes to show you the extent of how harm exists. But our teams, we sit with diaspora stakeholders and walk them through the major parts of the community standards. 
And secondly, we've worked tirelessly, incredibly hard to begin translating the community standards in multiple languages, because we also realize that diasporas, you know, they're not going to they're not going to post in one of the five or one of the recognized UN languages or post in English. They're going to post in their native languages as well. So we've been working um, with a number of, of top priority countries and communities in different languages around the world to ensure that audiences can also understand it in their indigenous language. I will tell you from from um, my experience with African diasporas, many communities write uh, and post in their native language or in, in some sort of blended version with English and in my case, because I'm in the US. So reducing harm and fighting misinfo is, is a major um, strategy. The, the last thing I'll say is we also work with diaspora organizations who have uh, networks and a platform to help disseminate this information. So for diaspora organizations who want to um, promote uh, the fighting misinfo and help communities learn how to be safe, safer on our platform, um, we, we regularly partner. And so there's an opportunity there to help inform and raise awareness about staying safe on our platform. Thank you so much for raising these very important and critical questions on digital governance. I think we have a lot of work to do all from our um, respective organizations and we're here to, to listen from the experiences. So thank you so much for sharing that. I will um, open the mic to and ask to open the mic um, um, to Dr. Charles Hennessy, who has joined us. Um, please, you have the floor. Um, thank you very much uh, for this wonderful session. And thanks, I am Geneva, for bringing my attention to it. And thanks, Samuel, for such a wonderful um, presentation and display of knowledge of diaspora engagement, and the other colleague, Doctor, as well. Indeed, you said it all. Um, that's most of us in the diaspora. I'm that, I mean, originally from Sierra Leone in West Africa. I've been in Switzerland for the past 18 years, and I work in so many countries across Africa in almost all also the continent through my Afro-European medical research network. Normally something has to push you to action in the diaspora, either from personal experiences in family or just the frustration that something is not working in many of the low and middle income countries, you need to jump on board, or by just tagging along or listening to wonderful presentation like this. And indeed, with the diaspora, we have a lot to contribute to our countries or continents of origin. And because most of us, we know the two sides of the world. It is normally said the best pilot that can fly you to a particular country is the one who knows the route very well, which is very correct. Each time I'm on a flight landing in, in the UK, if it's British Airways, I feel extra comfortable. This pilot knows this route very well. And so same way goes for the diaspora. We, in terms of diaspora, in terms of disaster, like as Samuel said, we almost always rise to the occasion or the forefront because we know the local condition. We know where the gaps are. We know how exactly to contribute physically or even virtually. And we are good in raising funds, like I'm doing now for mobile clinics I run all over Africa. And then, indeed, we impact our countries of origin. We impact the diaspora in the countries where we stay. And we are normally given a lot of chances. I'm based in Switzerland, and the Swiss authorities give a lot of platform for the diaspora to help our continents or countries of origin. For example, the Swiss African Forum, we are recognized in Switzerland. We run lots of programs and we act as think tanks when it comes to specific intervention, especially during the COVID I mean, pandemic in reaching out to our population with the key information that they need. And uh, even at the World Health Organization, in the area of acute shortage of healthcare workers, they recognize the power of the diaspora in engaging us actively so that we can also help in the continent or countries of our origin by the Global Health Workforce Alliance taking train of us around the globe. And most of our host countries have seen the potentials of diaspora. I'll be flying in next week Tuesday to help shape the healthcare delivery system of Sierra Leone in their first ever health summit. They recognize the power of the foundation of the diaspora, how we can engage, how we can look at resources, human material and financial from both sides of the aisle. So we are a powerful force for change. And I'm very much happy that this forum has provided us the platform to sort of engage us, especially the IOM, as effective partners in, in bringing some of these services down to the low and middle income countries. And what I, my short question also is the use of the embassies and consulates to reach out to the diaspora, because every country has got consulates in so many areas around the globe. 
And I believe the health as information attaches. I'm working with the country of Sierra Leone and the IAM in Sierra Leone also to see how we can map out this diaspora I'm, 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 I'm professionals. And my, my Minister of Health in Sierra Leone, in fact, has created a special office of diaspora for healthcare workers to harness the resources of the healthcare workers because there is a lot we can do. So I would like to see how much we can actually um, engage and accelerate or upgrade this initiative from Sierra Leone in reaching out using the embassies and consulates. They are like low hungry food. It exists in almost every country. And through them, we can actually map out the healthcare professional or other professionals. Sorry, I'm not only biased from health uh, because health is according to 1948, the finishes more holistic view. But I look at the doctors and nurses as a first line now. And so thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Senesi. I will give the floor to Dr. Sayid, um, who has kindly agreed to respond to this question. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Charles, for uh, asking this very important question. And uh, here in this shoes, I speak uh, as a former uh, ambassador and a former consul general in uh, um, major diaspora uh, countries. I was the consul general in Chicago and also ambassador most recently in Saudi Arabia, where we have uh, large uh, diaspora groups there. Uh, one of the things definitely the embassies and the consulates do is to reach out to different groups, professional groups. Uh, we realize the strength of the diaspora in the sense that they have been living in those countries for years together and sometimes decades together. And in the process, they have uh, uh, you know, amassed a great uh, vast knowledge uh, in terms of the domain specialization where they're working. So what we typically do is to reach out to the specialized groups, let's say the engineers, the chartered accountants, the doctors, the business people, and many groupings are, uh, if there are groupings which are already existing, to reinforce these groupings, to engage with them, uh, the idea being to learn from them and to take suggestions, what could be uh, uh, the areas in which we as the host government could uh, uh, could concentrate based on their experiences. In some instances, uh, uh, what we have also done is that where such groupings didn't exist and where we uh, realize the potential in a particular segment, for example, uh, uh, the research and science, science and technology or uh, uh, academics, uh, then we have encouraged, uh, you know, uh, the Indian diaspora, uh, people working in those things to, to form groups and then engage with the embassies and consulates. You're uh, very correct that since the reach of the consulates uh, and the embassies is quite broad, it is quite easy if they are very proactive and engage with the, uh, with the diaspora. We generally um, encourage both the ambassadors and the uh, and the consul general and other diplomatic staff to uh, to mingle, travel, and, uh, and typically when they travel out to each province, uh, we expect them to engage with the universities, engage with the diaspora. So that way, we broaden our network, and this is how also we learn about uh, the skills. Sometimes there are unique skills of the Indian diaspora or the other diaspora for that matter, and uh, those skills uh, uh, sometimes. Uh, you know, may not be available, you may not be aware until you go and reach out to them in person. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, we, we reached out uh, when I was there in U.S., a professor who was doing a unique kind of uh, research, you know, we're using nanotechnology to enhance the uh, efficacy of the Indian traditional uh, medicine. So uh, unless and until we reach out, we may not be uh, aware of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of talents which are available. So you are uh, uh, really correct and endorse what you say is that Indian, uh, the, the embassies and the consulates of uh, uh, all countries which are uh, having big diaspora can play a very, very important role uh, in, uh, in assimilating the diaspora in, uh, in decision making and also influencing their host countries. Thank you. Thank you so much for your response and for this very exciting session. I learned a lot from you. I love the, the multi-stakeholder approach. It's fascinating to have this open and horizontal dialogue with all the actors involved. So I just want to thank, before giving the floor um, to Dr. Sayid for the closing remarks, want to thank you all again, and specifically to the government of Ireland who has been supporting and leading this process of bringing us today together. So with that, I will give you the floor, Dr. Sayid for the closing remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Larissa Lara. First of all, I would like to thank you for moderating this session uh, very, very effectively. Um, at the outset, I would like to thank the government of Ireland you know, for uh, organizing the, uh, the important session uh, on the uh, Global Diaspora, organizing the Global Diaspora Summit itself. 
and of course we will be looking forward to the main sessions from monday onwards uh, i uh, enjoyed the uh, keynote address uh, from semhar uh, from the uh, facebook perspective uh, being a avid user of all the uh, facebook tools myself and having been connected to the diaspora especially during the uh, difficult covid times i understand and realize uh, uh, the importance of uh, uh, social media and companies like yours you know in playing a very important role uh, and providing these tools also and placing these tools also at the disposal of governments to reach out to the diaspora um, at the same time uh, from the diaspora perspective uh, i appreciate uh, uh, dr hemant kumar for uh, sharing his perspective and his vision of how uh, the the uh, the diaspora could uh, connect both the uh, their uh, origin country of origin and the country of homeland uh, and so together i feel that and very very interactive question and answer session which we had uh, covering different aspects so it was a, a very good amalgamation of uh, perspectives involving the government the private sector and the end user which is the diaspora and how the three different entities can be uh, connected uh, using the technology to create a digital diaspora and i'm looking forward uh, we are looking forward to uh, continuing this uh, discussion in, uh, in the hybrid form uh, in you know the beginning of next week so thank you very much all of you for uh, joining this session and uh, making this very useful for our class thank you